Welcome to another broadcast of the Lorain County Commissioner's General Meeting. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Thursday mornings at 9.30 at the Lorain County Administration Building, 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings, and as always, you are invited to attend. Good morning. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The microphone? Good morning. Welcome to the September 27th, 2007, Lorain County Board of Commissioners meeting. Commissioner Kukowski has the dog today. Our quote for today. Hello, hello. You'll like this. Change is inevitable, except from a vending machine. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Oh, he's working on it, David. We have a cute one today. I don't think my microphone's working, is it? Can you hear me? We have a, actually it's a full grown, maybe a year and a half old Cocker Spaniel mix. Uh, you can come and see him at our dog kennel located on Hathaway Street. You can also check out our website online, um, Lorraine County uh, Dog Kennel, and just uh, click on Dogs to Adopt. And we have plenty to choose from. I was just there the other day, and there's great looking dogs. So if you need a pet for your family, come on down and, and pick one out. Confirmed boundaries of Villa, Village of Grafton. Petition map and legal description were received on December 29, 2006 from Richard G. Lilly, Law Director, and Gretchen Holderman, Assistant Law Director, Village of Grafton, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 503.07 to include recently annexed property and make the boundary of said township identical with the corporate limits of the municipality. Village of Grafton passed the following ordinances which accepted the various annexations of certain properties. Ordinance 06029 petition conformed and extend the current boundaries of Austinville Township to include real property annexed to the village of Grafton from Grafton Township, Ean Township, and Carlisle Township, so that the boundaries of said Austinville Township are identical with the corporate limits of the village of Grafton. Ordinance 9167 accepted application 93.9068 acres of Ean Township, that was Shamrock Development, granted by the commissioners on April 12, 1990. Ordinance 91-226 accepted the application of 43.7919 acres of Carlisle Township for Shamrock Development granted by the commissioners <coughs> on February 5, 1991. Ordinance 95023 accepted 33.96 acres from Grafton Township. Grundy was the petitioner <coughs> granted by the commissioners on May 31, 1995. Ordinance 00005, 31.4764 acres from Grafton Township. Commissioners appeared on October 28, 1999. Ordinance 00012, 40.4972 acres from Ean, Town, uh, Ean Township, <coughs> which was Shamrock Development, granted by the commissioners on January 10, 2000. Ordinance 02033, 1.1867 acres of, uh, from Grafton Township, that was for Brada property. Commissioners granted on August 8, 2002. And Ordinance 05032, 25.58 acres from Grafton Township, this is Carrington Estates granted by the commissioners on May 19, 2005. On January 8th, I referred all the documents to the county engineer and the auditor. January 25th, the certificate of filing was received from the auditor. On the 29th of January, auditor revealed discrepancies between the legal description ma map produced by the consultant. January 30th, engineer requested several resolutions and maps from the clerk relating to the previous documents. February 12th, the clerk sent all the documents as requested by the engineer. March 8th, the clerk forwarded to the engineer more documents from 1954 and 1955. July 12th, the engineer reviewed the documents received from the village of Grafton and the clerk. Map provided by the village had four discrepancies. August 7th, the engineer explained the discrepancies in further detail. Exhibit A and B showed the, an the, the yellow shade area not annexed according to the records. Exhibit C further showed on Exhibit B, Corporation Lyles Files the Black River. 
Exhibit D, Correction and South Corporation Line, and Exhibit E showed 50.4 acre parcel annex by resolution in, on June 17, 1975. August 3rd, the clerk contacted the assistant law director to explain the yellow shade from the, from the village. August 23rd, Village of Grafton corrected the map to be used on the village's 2006 application to conform the boundaries. September 13th, the Village of Grafton amended the petition from the December 29, 2006 to include all the previous stated resolutions, um, as well as all Ward 1, 2, and 3 descriptions with the map. And then on September 29th, the engineer reviewed the amended map and petition with all the documents to conform, and the map does show the proper boundary caused by the annexation of record. Any comments, Bill, for the engineer's office? Thank you. And Linda Bales is here, but I don't know if she has anything to say. Linda, any comments? No comments. No comments? Any comments from the township? That was Linda. Oh, that was just Linda? Okay. No attorney comments? Jerry? Uh, no, the commissioners are required to do it if all the legal requirements are met. Wonderful. What did you say, Jerry? The, the commissioners are required to conform the boundaries if all the legal requirements are met. And they are met? Correct. This is a have to <coughs> commissioner. Well, I, I just wanted to hear that again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you asked me what Rossonville Township was. Yes, I did. I, I think for the benefit of anybody who might be listening, a little historical might be in order, Jerry, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, and Linda Bales, you can chime in, but I believe that Rossonville Township was formed, it's a, a paper township, and it was formed to, uh, coincide with the um, uh, limits of Grafton Village. And this uh, document then will bring all the annexations into um, the Rossonville Township, which is a non-existing paper township. Can you make a better definition of that, Jerry? No, I think that's accurate, Commissioner. Okay. <laughs> so that's what Rossonville Township is. Motion to approve. If that was, I'll second. Any further discussion? Ms. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Ms. Aye. Uh, there is a proclamation today just to let everybody know the state wanted every county to do this. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. October 2nd will be the kickoff of the Ohio State House Atrium. And more information can be found at www.rsc.ohio.gov. Under resolutions, number one, Job and Family Services Bills. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Investments? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Appropriations? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Transfers? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Advances and repayments? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Kayla? Aye. Ms. Kowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Requisitions? So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Travel expenses. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Bills. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Under the commissioners authorize various personnel actions as indicated on the summary for employees within jurisdiction of the Lane County Commissioners. Mr. Cordes. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a number of personnel actions, uh, new potential new hires <coughs> at uh, Department of Job and Family Services and Golden Acres Nursing Home. Uh, plus, I wish to update you uh, on our labor negotiations uh, with the Teamsters and the United Auto Workers of America and a potential purchase of real estate that we've been discussing. I'll give you information on an update on that. Uh, and for the moment, I think that's enough, but it's going to be a bit of a session this morning because I have some significant issues in all of those that we need to discuss. So I would request an executive session at the conclusion of a regular board meeting, and these are all permissible topics under the Sunshine Law. Thank you. All right, community development, create an incentive district located in Lorain County, Ohio, declaring the agreement of parcels within the <coughs> district to be a public purpose and exempt from real property taxation for specific periods, designating public infrastructure improvements that will benefit or serve such parcels, requiring the owners of such parcels to make annual service payments in lieu of taxes, establish a redevelopment tax equivalent fund, approve a tax in increment financing agreement, Create a tax incentive review council incorporated by reference certain county non-discriminatory hiring policies for tax exemption 
recipients and authorize related actions pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 5709.77 through 8185. And Mr. Twenty, I believe, is going to. Mr. Twenty? Good morning, Commissioners. I thought I would give a little background. Last week, we asked you to approve the Economic Development Plan for Amherst Township, which we identified as the first step in uh, the approval process for a TIF. We're now at step number two, um, and that is to actually ask you to consider the resolution establishing a TIF. Um, before we uh, talk at any detail about the TIF, let me just give you a little background for the audience um, here and watching this on the TV. I think it was about three years ago there was an annexation request by Mr. Parrott, Bob Parrott of R.J. Parrott Homes, wanting to annex a parcel of land into Amherst City. Um, Amherst Township was here with their attorney and protested that. and. Because Mr. Parrott was willing to, uh, to work and Amherst was willing to work and the township was willing to work, he withdrew his request for the annexation and that there was an agreement that it would remain in the township and that he would develop and get the utilities extended by the city out into the township area. Um, while doing that, he went through and, and his parcel He's proposing 41 homes, and it's about a $13,350,000 investment into Lorain County and certainly Amherst School District. Um, the review process, because of how the sewer lines needed to be done and the manholes that were requested of Amherst, the cost of the sewer went from about 100000 to 400000 He was willing to do that, but he asked the county if we would consider extending the main downpile road at that $400,000 cost by doing a TIF. We've been in uh, considerable discussions with Mr. Parrott and everybody from the health district to the, to the city and the township concerning this project. And we're now here today saying that we're at a point we have given the 14-day notice required by law to the JVS and the Amherst schools. And we would like to talk a little bit about what we're asking you to, to approve in a 10-year 75% TIF for the uh, public improvements that will be needed in order to allow him to make this $13 million uh, residential housing project materialize. Um, the sewer line extension down Pile Road will be 1,800 feet at a cost of about $400,000. By using TIF dollars, you will not be asked nor be required to assess the existing property owners on that 1,800 foot line. We've heard the, the public discussions on many uh, sewer projects, and uh, it was decided that really for the extension of that main, that that is something that a TIF could fund, and perhaps this was a better alternative, so it wasn't on the back solely of the people moving into the new development and the existing property owners. So that's the impetus for the, uh, the TIF itself. Along with that, we've also heard, you know, the State law says that if you're within 200 feet of the sewer main, you have to connect to the sewer line. And that has been the next point of discussion before this board. Um, property owners are saying the assessment, my system presently works, why do I have to adjust it? Mr. Cordes and I met and talked with Mr. Parrott and um, the concept was uh, born that if the sewer project was originally going to cost Mr. Parrott 100000 or thereabout, perhaps we could have an escrow account that he would pay into so that it didn't become public funds, and then that escrow account would pay for half of the cost of the laterals or the line going from our sewer main to the house and it would include the, the tap in, the permits, it would include collapsing or slurrying the, the septic tank and making the connection to the house. Um, to be honest with you, I think Chris Conley will remember the numbers. It's been a while since I looked at the numbers, but there was a dollar amount not to exceed per house, and I think that was like $7,000 per structure um, or up to 50% of the cost of that construction. 
typically these connections run about 6,000. So if it was a 6,000, we would pay half of that or $3,000, and the other half would be paid by the property <coughs> owner. Um, we set this uh, escrow account up so that we could provide that assistance, and it would be one less hurdle for the existing property owners. We believe there are 11 property owners. Um, two probably will be eligible for low-income assistance through the CDBG. We'll go that route with them. And we're guessing there are several that are back far enough. They're not going to be required to connect, but the money is available, so we've funded it so that we could help. We've asked Mr. Parrott to put $80,000 into this escrow account. As a part of that, um, the issue then come up, what do we do should the improvements and, and laterals be made if there's money left in the escrow account? We've worked it out with Mr. Parrott in the developer's agreement that unspent escrow funds will be used at the discretion of the county commissioners on future sewer projects that you deem appropriate. Um, and we have also added a sentence in there that uh, would allow, if, this, if the commissioners feel it appropriate, to provide assistance to the local school district. Um, that wording is in there. Just so that we have some numbers, and then I will call on Chris Conley from the attorney that helped put this up to make any legal comments that he wishes to make, but just so that we have some numbers, this $13 million investment, once we figure in a rather complicated formula with school funding, average daily student attendance and, and things like that, the uh, current taxes as farm property is bringing in $407 to the school district. The school formula will be adjusted if this $13 million is added to the valuation of the Amherst School District, and it will reduce the amount the school district receives for reimbursement from the state of Ohio. Actually, um, by having a 75% 10-year TIF in place, instead of the full $13 million valuation hitting the formula and adjusting downward, we will only have 25% go to the school funding formula, or a little over $3 million, about $3.5 million. And so they will have less of a reduction in the payments from the school formula. But even calculating in the adjustment the best we could on the school um, with the formula adjustment and the uh, $3 million that will hit, the new taxes with this development once completed will be $7,659. So the, by the commissioners approving this TIF that will pay for the sewer improvement that will allow Mr. Parrott to make the investment on, um, for the residential property, the county and the, the uh, township and, and school district will see $13 million of value added to their property and their tax collection at 25% will go from the current 407 to the school receiving $7,659. Um, it is our recommendation that you approve the, the TIF that this is fair and reasonable to the school district. With that, I think uh, Chris Conley is here and would like to make a few additional comments because he's worked on this for us. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I think uh, I, I don't have a lot to add. I think Mr. Twining did a good, did a really good job of explaining. Uh, I mean, I I could sit up here and talk about the school funding formula for hours and bore you all to death. But I, I think Mr. Twining did a really good job explaining as to ha how this how this would affect the schools, and you know, just from a stepping back a little bit and looking at the at the forest, um, just a, as a general concept, this property undeveloped is worth I think about two hundred thousand um, dollars and w with the development as Mr. Twining noted it would be worth over thirteen million dollars twenty five percent of which would, would, would be taxable to the schools is still three point four million dollars so the, the, the schools will be reaping the benefits of, uh, of this project um, even even only receiving twenty five percent under the TIF. Um, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions, technical questions, legal questions, if you have any. Chris, uh, 
I see what was added on. Uh, there were some concerns with the Amherst School District. But on this revised code, and I spoke to Mr. Twine this morning, 5709.82 is just for school districts. How come joint vocational school isn't included in this wording? Because they are also a, you know, um, we tax entity, I guess, whatever you like to call it, uh, yeah, subdivision. Th <laughs> there is um, statutory authority for, for compensating all kinds of, of taxing districts, including school districts and non-school districts. As, as you know, uh, local school districts, in other words, not including joint vocational school districts, are, are protected in a lot of ways under the law with, with, with these incentives, including TIFs. Um, that language could certainly be tweaked to, to include uh, not only the Amherst schools, but if you'd like the joint vocational schools in there too, we could certainly do that. Well, my concern would be if we're going to do that area, you would have to compensate both school districts that it encompasses would be my thing. And I don't know what the percentage is. Mm -hmm. Through JVS is a lot less yeah. out of the new tax. But the way I'm looking at it, on the annual money, we do the TIF, we put a project, we bring more disposable income to the area. The schools still receive over 10 years, 72,000 more than what they're receiving at this point, and then they will get the full yes. amount of the money after that. Once the TIF is and done. And whether we've that's also protected their interest in not changing their school funding because this project, Mr. Parrott, is basically based on empty nesters, I would guess. Yes, that's correct. These are not, you know, where we're loading the school district, so it looks like it's a win-win project, especially with the 80,000 <coughs> escrow Mr. Parrott's given to help not harm the residents along the new sewer line. I think you did a very good job. Nice project. Thank you. One uh, question the payments Chris. that we're offering to possibly give to school districts, is it any type of in-kind contributions? Because I, I spoke to Mr. Boynton a couple times yesterday on the phone, and any kind of monies that are given to the school has to be, uh, to the state has to be, it's revenue, and then that decreases the amount that the state gives to the school. So. <clears throat> is there a way for us to give them money that would not be considered revenue, like any in-kind contributions? Um, the, the, the way that I understand, and uh, that's, that, that's a really good point. It was actually, a, the, the law was changed, as a lot of you know, in January of 2006, where the school funding formula was changed so that uh, a compensation that is paid to school districts in, in connection with exemptions um, pursuant to certain agreements does have a, have a negative impact on the schools and their school funding. Um, my understanding of the way that language works is that, is that the value of in-kind contributions would, would have that effect also. Um, it's certainly something that we could take a look at. And I, I, that question has come up before in other deals, and I know that in-kind contributions are common, commonly given um, to school districts in connection with deals like this, but I'm, I think that those types of, of contributions also would have the same effect um, as cash, as regular cash compensation payments would. What if they had, like I said, asked him if there was like a specific project that the school was looking to do, if we can take care of that project in some way as a, in kind, so it's not actually cash given to the schools, mm -hmm. something like that. Can we? It's, it, it's a gray area as far as what is compensation to a school district. I mean, I think my, my instinct is that there, there are ways in which a deal like that could be structured to minimize the impact on the school district, but uh, th th that would be a decision that the school district treasurer would have to make when he or she was reporting uh, that information to the state each year. Right. I don't think that falls on the county to no. determine <laughs> where they're going to put it in a line item of any sort, so Mr. Cordell. Yeah, Chris, is, uh, J is JVS one of those statu new statutory agencies that we have to uh, make whole under the new war? I, I, um, I mean, I, you know the ones I'm talking about. I There's a few so. of them under the new law that, that we have to be cognizant of that we didn't have to be before. Uh, um, came around. Th there is no provision that I'm aware of in the law that requires JVSs to be made whole. Okay. Um, as you know, J J JVSs are generally don't have a lot of the same protections that local school districts do, and generally their millage is 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 pretty low. Right. And also the school funding formula for JVSs is slightly different than it is for regular school districts. So I I don't think that, that JVSs are one of those entities. Yeah, I know we talked about a bunch of them and Ron and I talked about a bunch of them. I just wasn't sure if JVS was one of them. Okay. 
Sure. And Mr. Cortez, I believe those that kick in would be if it's greater than a 10-year TIF, it's 30, and it starts at year 11. Townships certainly are the, the big animal. I think JBS was not in that list, but okay. that's for 30-year TIF, not 10-year TIF. So okay, great. Point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments? Mr. Chairman, is it your suggestion that um, the um, joint vocational school be included as an add-on under a item A, page 3? Well, I think that was in our discussion because they fit under a different rule. Correct, Chris? Correct. Correct. Yeah, so at this point, because it says under the Board of Commissioners, so if we wanted any kind of someone else could actually go there to make them whole or to make up any loss, we're not just to the Amherst School. That's why I was asking if we had to include them also being a school district. Yes. Or not. It doesn't look like we have to based on your explanation. Correct. We don't have to because they don't have the same protection as a local jurisdiction. Yeah. Certainly you could. Um, but at this at point, we're, we're suggesting that we leave the wording as is, and then it's at the discretion of the board. Um, Commissioner Kukowski asked a question, and just for clarification, you ask about, in your question today, annual payments. The way this has been set up as it was revised late yesterday, that is a one-time payment at the conclusion of our needing the escrow account to make those taps. So it's no annual payments. The annual right. payments will be the 25% of the increased value that if it was all built today would amount to about 72,000 over a 10 year period. And we're looking at four to six years for this project to be completion, I'm assuming, is that what the? If everything, if the cost estimates for the sewer and we don't run into rock and a few things like that, yeah, that's where what, we're at. What was our, uh, uh, annual re revenue estimate from the TIF again. Do you remember the annual revenue of the TIF? Um, I could get it from. <laughs> we'll look quick. I yeah, don't Commissioners, this is, you know, when, when the project gets going, this is, uh, we're probably going to stay in construction notes on this for a number of years. Well, it should be three times whatever their revenue period is, correct? Yeah. yeah so we're looking at about $23,000. A year? Would it be triple? Yes. Okay. About twenty three thousand. Twenty two, twenty three. About. Okay, yeah. approximately twenty two or twenty three thousand dollars a year towards the debt service of the new sewer line. And then we're looking at when this project ends, whatever dollars might be left based on increased building cost could then be allocated by the board. So your total revenue intake projection? Did we did we do a total revenue uh, projection, Ron? No. We'll look at that. We'll look at that. We, I don't remember seeing that yet. Okay. Ron, when, when you and I first spoke of this, we were talking about uh, how long it was going to take. And I know we have a 10-year, but you said there was, it was possible that we wouldn't need the full 10 years. How, how do we determine that, and what, what would it take for it to be less? Yeah, I'm going to give you the simplest answer because it's a rather complex answer. But... Uh, it depends on how quickly the houses are built and sold that they become taxable. If he does this in two years, we can probably have everything paid, we're guessing, in about five or six years. Because there's a slow housing market out there, um, we think he has a high quality of housing and that they'll sell quickly, but if it takes four or five years, we won't be getting the revenue in as quickly um, so therefore it will go the full 10 years but we need to get the 400,000 back well, yes and we're, we're going to finance this and then recoup our finance that's that's still being worked yeah, out I um, you and I talked about that we, we have a couple of questions the question come up could we uh, do notes construction notes on this and we're still working out some of that details um, if that's the case, then we're asking that if we do the issue the notes on this, then any debt payment that we fall short through the collection of the TIF, we're asking the developer to cover that cost rather than the commissioner's guaranteeing, and then the TIF at the end would reimburse him for that. But we're still trying to decide whether it, it meets the criteria. Anthony has that question. Yeah, I, I know that you and I threw this against the wall a couple of times. Right. Uh, you know, commissioners, what, because it's a small issue, well, it's hard for us to do $400,000 worth of financing. It just costs too much money, and it adds a great load to the overall all-in rate. So. Some of the things we've been talking about, we can, we can stay in construction notes for seven or eight years, and 
uh, we would just recapitalize the note so we didn't have any payments until the revenue came in. It adds a little bit of uh, burden to the overall cost, but while the development's ongoing and we do the financing, we won't have to pay anything. We can just keep rolling that right. year after year Which for a while. Which is standard process. We've <laughs> yeah, we, we, on all our projects. Yeah, a lot of our construction projects we do that way. And then sometimes we stay in notes a while longer while we watch the market and the up and downs mm -hmm. in the marketplace. And we try to time it. We're not always great, but we try to get into the market when the rates are best for us to do so. So I, but you, I've told you before, four hundred thousand dollar, it's hard for us. It costs it, too much money to process. It, it, it also right. would help the developer in the fact that he wouldn't have to go out and borrow the eighty thousand for the escrow and the four hundred thousand for this, and then carry the service while he paid the contractor and a few things like that. So that's why we've uh, taken a look at it, and we're working with legal counsel to make sure it passes muster. We're going to try and do that but it has to meet certain thresholds. And the other, thing, the other thing we can do is next year, we'll, uh, as you know, we're finishing up on all our package plans and then we're consolidating our, our um, construction notes right now so we have one issue. If things go well next year, we, can, we could lump this in with, with a jumbo issue, uh, grab a better rate and get out of the, get out of the, uh, the construction notes. The market's ripe right now, and I think it's going to stay that way for at least another year. So and I think they're going to drop rates another quarter. Uh, uh, well, God you know, bless them. We're looking for that every, you know, every quarter percent on the when we refinance adjustments, and it gives us a lot of money. We're, we're going to be doing that next month. So uh, there's some options there, but I don't think we're going to see any uh, out of pocket in the county for, uh, on this uh, process. Okay. Nice project, Mr. Parrott. Would you like to say anything about your project, or if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Uh, well, I want, I want okay. one, one more thing. Oh, it I'm says sorry, any, any money remaining in the sewer fund, which is the $80,000 escrow fund, after the reimbursement payments described in Section 2D, and that's to refund the, the residents who need, have to tie in. Yes, right. It says Herefore, hereof shall be used by the county at the county's discretion either to help pay for sanit or sewer costs incurred by the county or to make a payment to the Amherst exempted school district. It's pretty vague and it's not really guaranteeing anything, I think. It's guaranteeing the commissioners will make that decision. We tried to leave it to, we tried to leave it broad based so you have some room to make decisions in the future what you'd like to do with that. It's better than we were yesterday, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have something specific you'd like to see, Commissioner? Well, I wanted to give Amherst School a little bit just to, you know, help them, you know, get through this TIF. I mean, it's not, we don't have to do anything for them. I realize that. But just, you know, out of good faith effort to, you know, to help them deal with, you know, this TIF too, to guarantee that they would get something for the school district. Well, I actually think they're ending up ahead with the 72000 over 10 years versus the 4000 they would receive over 10 years. They're already getting 72000 I understand additional, that. And it's not going to affect what the school is going to fund them with from the state of Ohio. Because you had a $13.5 million extra to the affluent area, they're going to lose dollars and cents anyway. Well, that's why the I was school, trying to find an in-kind If the development moves so forward the and it, the value completely hit the... Uh, the school funding, the state revenue would really drop at that point. The so per pupil allocation? We, yeah. yeah. Um, What's and right so now? Do we know what they get per pupil? I know Lorraine's 65 I, I or do not. Do you? I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I know what the state statutory amount is that they factor into the formula, but I'm not sure okay. with the property values out there how that works exactly okay. with Amherst. So this will be at the commissioner's discretion once the project is built out? Once the project's built out and the connections, there'll be a timetable with the health department when they send the existing property owners on that main have to hook up. We'll give them over. the amount of time, and then at that period, whatever money, say we use 56 of the 80,000, then it'll be at your discretion. Do you want to give them, you know, half of that? A thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, but whatever yeah, the, the I, money left. I wouldn't so. anticipate though a great deal of funding. Uh, yeah, it's not a great, great deal. Of no funds yeah. left. I mean, if we're looking at four or five years before they're required to tie in the cost right. of it, doing sewers, could cost through the off. roof, and it, and it could be longer than that, Commissioner. Because right, it could be. I'm just looking at the fast track, right, hoping right. it sells all 41 quickly. Well, it's not just that. I mean, the sewer will be in while the development's being built, but it all depends on 
you know, we've seen we've seen some unique arrangements made uh, for tap-ins on the sewers because some people have new sanitaries on their property, and they've been given you know five seven years before they're required to tap-in because the health department has tried to be responsive to the homeowner's needs. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to indicate that even we had full build-out in three or four years and it was very aggressive and things went well. The homeowner still may not have been required to tap in yet. Uh, I think one of the sewers we did, they had seven years, didn't they, in one of the deals mm -hmm. with the health department. So I'm just trying to get all the information out there for, for clarity's sake. And, and $80,000, while it, it, it sounds like a lot of money, once you count the homeowners there and it's the money that's going to be on there on site and their taps and stuff, it's, I, I don't think there's going to be much revenue left. Right, and I think that's state rules within 200 feet. It's something that we right. decide in the health department. And, has and, to and we have out. talked to the health department. They're aware of this and, and uh, are willing to right. work with and, us on the notice. And I would so. anticipate the people that are further back, the two homes that are further back, because there's money available to do this. Don't yeah, I, I would think that their costs are going to be huge if they go in on their own in years to come. So I would think that they probably would try to avail themselves to uh, you know get some of these resources uh, while they're while they're, they're available to them to get that larger connection from way back on their property. So uh, my thinking is make sure that we have enough there uh, so we can we can carry out this plan. And by the way, something we haven't pointed out here, and Ron briefly said it. This is a brand new program that nobody else is doing around the state, commissioners. This is this is you know, once again a unique program to improve the community. And with your guidance and leadership, we're we're able to do this. And sometimes we we get so busy we forget that we we are innovating in in the way we're doing our business on behalf of the community and the residents here. And when you factor in everything, that's where we think that it's a, a fair deal to everybody. It's not penalizing the existing property owners that are going to have to connect because of the, the law requirements. It's not putting an adverse burden on the school if unless they're going to start talking about the money they could have received. Um, you know, it's, I think, fair and reasonable to everybody, and it's met the requirements that you've confronted with as f in terms of assessments and then the connection fee, I think we've taken this as far as, as we can at this point. We and are and setting precedents. And we've seen, we've seen a, a great amount of difficulty uh, in one of our larger townships where we've been trying to put a TIF in. We have a sewer agreement. We have a developer with a huge, huge, huge project. And uh, every time we get close to working on the TIF with, with the uh, trustees out there, we seem to run into a problem. We think we have it done. We think we have the agreement with them. And you see Ron shaking his head. We've, we've been out there many times. And, and then something happens, and we don't end up doing anything. And this developer has been stalled now for uh, about Over two, two years. We've about stalled two years. this project. And the sewer, it's a massive sewer project that we're talking about. But we need the TIF to be able to pay for the bigger part of the sewer. And we've also worked with them that the residents along the way wouldn't be affected by their development. Because I don't. I know and I believe in this very wholeheartedly, people should not be affected by development that's way downstream from them uh, because the developer is going to, is doing that, uh, improving the community but also making a profit and people shouldn't be suffering along that way because of that. So that I, I, Ron and I have sat down many times with these developers and indicated to them that they have to do something to, to mitigate that cost onto the affected people along the way and I think we've been rather successful. And Ron and I had that talk this morning. Again, motion. Oh, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, your comments. Um, Elizabeth from Ex Oberlin. This is sheer curiosity. Where is this very interesting sounding project located? That would be called South Pile Middle Ridge Road. Is that the official South Pile? Okay. Okay. It, to me, it's just Kobe Road South. <laughs> from out of Lorraine, so it's South Pile Middle Ridge Such a Road. City boy. Yeah, <laughs> well, you, well, you know, Commissioner, if we get if we if we can get this done successfully, then maybe we can go revisit that other one again. We should. Okay. There's a heck of a project out there, and we also hold off the annexation to Cuyahoga County and Strongsville for water. There's a whole big project out there needs to get taken care of. I, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody where it was, but I guess everybody knows now. I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, nice job, by the way. Yeah, nice job working with everyone. Again, a motion to approve. Second. Aye. 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 And the workforce investment, approve and enter into various <coughs> contracts for vendor training with the incumbent workforce funds. Authorized County Administrator to execute on behalf of the Board of Prosecutors for us to form. One, <coughs> JP Horizons for equity trust in the amount not to exceed 11500 College in the amount not to exceed 53705 And equity trust in the amount not to exceed $4,349. So moved. Second. Discussion. Second. 
Commissioner? Yes. One second, please. Is, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to hold this and uh, table it to next week. I went over it yesterday, um, and I didn't see it on the agenda when I was out yesterday. It must have came on the agenda while I was out at meetings. Um, it was on the agenda, but the Vivian agenda. just emailed me the exact language. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not so. drawing any clue. I just I missed it then because uh, I, mm -hmm. I have a little bit of a concern with one of the issues. Not major. Uh, well, we're new I'll withdraw my motion. Right. Yeah, we're second. I'll withdraw my motion. Uh, the, the, uh, I, was, I went over this with the college uh, mm -hmm. yesterday afternoon, and I, I, uh, I have one minor question, and then I would like to bring it back to you, and then maybe next week I can give you a lead in on how we're going to reinvigorate this program because we've got a big marketing push. Uh, I met with the, um, the publisher uh, of uh, the journal yesterday also to talk about helping us with this program with some advertising and penetrating the market more fully so we can get more companies engaged. Mr. So, Sudbrook? Yes. Oh, I, wonderful. So, and we're, we're also <coughs> meeting with the Chronicle because we want to engage them as partners because we're just not getting the reach with the program we have. So if you would, thank you. I'll, I'll bring it back next week. Mr. Cordes, County Minister. It's on you. Your report. Comments, report. I don't have any further comments <laughs> or reports. Thank you. Mr. Ernest. Commissioners, I do have one uh, matter of uh, imminent litigation that I need to discuss with the commissioners in the executive session. Commissioner's report. Commissioner. Sure. Uh, well, Saturday I got to spend most of the afternoon in your lovely city of Oberlin at the Doggy Do Parade, and I didn't see you there, David. <laughs> uh, you were there? I, I got to be a judge. I got to be a judge. Um, longest ear, shortest ear, tallest dog, shortest dog, best trick, and best costume. So we had a lot of dogs um, doing wonderful tricks and a lot of costumes. Um, a lot of our dogs from our dog kennel that were rescued were there, so I got to see a lot of those. And the only negative is our dog pound, our dog kennel wasn't there to get our dog, dogs adopted. The APL was there, I think they adopted out like nine dogs or so, um, but our county kennel wasn't there to get our dogs adopted. I know we had a lot of dogs that could have been adopted that day, but it was a fun day, beautiful day, and uh, I really enjoyed that. So that's the end of my report. Okay. Commissioner Blunt? Um, you may touch on this, Ted, and that's fine, um, but I'll report on it first. Uh, Commissioner Kahlo and I attended a meeting earlier this week with representatives of the state. Uh, ODNR. Is that who they yes. were? Okay. Yes. It was regarding the scenic river designation for the Vermilion River. And uh, the Vermilion River is approximately 64 miles long. According to their uh, information sheet, is the source of the river is in Clear Creek Township, Ashland County. The mouth of the river is in the city of Vermilion and empties into Lake Erie. The river flows through Ashland, Huron, Lorraine, and Erie counties. So uh, Dan Martin, our Metro Parks director, was there, and I believe we told Dan if he submits a letter that uh, we would be interested in uh, submitting a uh, resolution to proceed with naming um, the Vermilion River a scenic river. Uh, it was very interesting what they had to say. And then secondly, I would like to announce officially um, that uh, Lieutenant Governor Lee Fisher has accepted an invitation from the Lorraine County Community Alliance to be our keynote speaker on Friday, October the whatever date it is, <laughs> October the 26th. And uh, so we're developing a program to um, form around the Lieutenant Governor, and we're looking forward to hearing him. Those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh. I won't talk about the Scenic River and where you pushed them to get Black River on there. I'm going to continue. Okay, all right. An opportunity to drop at Columbus on Friday. We had county commissioners' meetings down there, um, nominating new people to the board next year. Dan Troy from Lake County will be the new president. And you're also having quite a discussion about funding law libraries. So. Why is everybody making noises? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never get out of the meetings. How about that guy in New York? Uh, also, uh, I was at the Hispanic Fund dinner, uh, raising money for their scholarships. They did a very nice job. The Apple Fest was very interesting on Sunday. Um, spent a lot of time talking to people from throughout the county. It was just real interesting. Uh, I had a real nice conversation with Larry Policeman, Ray Jarvin, uh, who is also a new Russia Township trustee. Damn. 
Dan, Dan I'm sorry, I thought it said Ray. I had my glasses on again. Well, I told you to wear them. You <laughs> could see what was going on. I can't on. see far, though. Oh, you got to get And I also had a here. meeting with Mayor Piscura from Sheffield Lake, an update on his waterfront project. They're moving forward on that. Uh, looks like they're receiving some property from the people who own the shopping center. So it was a nice Good. week. And Governor Strickland will be coming to Lorain County on Monday. Uh, it's a fundraiser for a candidate for mayor in Lorain, but for 10 bucks, you get an opportunity to see the mayor. So I'm sure you can find it all over. Yeah. The governor. The governor. Yeah, he said mayor. Oh, it's the mayor's thing. You can see both of them. Um, see both of them. <laughs> I talked to Dr. Wood yesterday, um, and I do have another proposal that I want to give to Jerry uh, for him to be the medical director of our dog kennel. Um, I'm going to pass this down to you, and maybe you could look it over to see. He's actually going to farm out a lot of the work, so he's not going to to do everything. So I don't think we're going to need to go out for a request for proposals. But if you can find that out for me, Jerry, and take a look at this proposal, I'd really like to get, get on this as soon as possible. I talked to Tom about two weeks ago on that, on buttoning up some of this stuff, and I had Jack contact him from our dog okay. channel. So. Okay. Madam Clerk? Uh, board correspondence. Move the reading be waived. I'll second, but there's a couple items I want to uh, call your attention to. I think we got another. Done that in your report. Go ahead. Are you going to allow me to talk or not? <laughs> you are the chair. Uh, go ahead. Just Thank you. <laughs> Item number 18 is a memo from Dr. <laughs> Fox uh, talking about the dog kennel, and I think there's some important information that he carried in there. And the other one is about um, Lorraine County Transit. Which one is that, Teresa? I thought you had another item on there. Thank you very much from the audience. 209 signatures. Valerie's really been on the ball. I think we need to remember how important Lorraine County Transit is to those people who just do not have access to an automobile of their own. They Thank you. are loaded in the city of Lorraine. When I come to work, all the way down 21st Street, Oberlin Avenue, <laughs> downtown. Uh, yes, my name's uh, Valerie. Oh, Valerie. Hi, oh, Valerie. I did make it today, and uh, this is my first time, so I'll please bear with me. I've never made a public speech speech like this. Well, we so. need your name and your address and where you're uh, from. My name's uh, Valerie Krieg. I live at 3152 Fulmer Road, apartment 201 in Lorraine. <coughs> and what, what was the other That's, that's it. That's, that's it. All. That's all you need. Now, you, <laughs> now we know you're you. from Lorraine County. Okay. Okay. And yes, I've uh, printed up a petition and hoping to keep the buses running. Uh, earlier this year, the funding was cut by 500,000 for the bus buses. And I've printed in favor of keeping the buses running. Um, and I've distributed them out to people and have people sign them and everything. And this is my concern that uh, they may cut another 500,000 towards the bus funding and we may not have the buses running and it, it would affect many people in the community, so. And uh, many of those who do take the bus are, you know, the disabled, the elderly, and people with families that can't drive and need to get to work especially in the winter time when it's bad out. So I was hoping to come here and uh, discuss this today and uh, um, hoping to make a change, so. Okay. Any comments, questions? I thank you for coming, Valerie, and for your efforts. You know that the cut was made by this board because yes. of a shortage of funds and right. we do have a sales tax issue on the ballot in November. Right. I believe it's the intention of this board that if the tax passes, we will restore that funding for next year. Okay. But if it doesn't, we're going to face the same cut for next year, if not more. Okay. But those are my comments, mm -hmm. I, but okay. everybody here. I is agree wholeheartedly, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Able to speak. Okay. Just to amplify that, we're really struggling. Uh, okay. and. I know that we've received a, a few complaints about <coughs> the service lately, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, we're, we're really tight, and Ron and I have been monitoring transit real closely, but we're really, really struggling uh, to provide a quality service with the financing that we have now, and, and 
the board has given us, I believe, all they can right now, and it's 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 going to be difficult. We may have to even go back under the financing we have now and find some additional economies. And I guess that was a polite word for saying we may need to slow down some of the routes even further and and extend some of them so we can pull a few buses off the road and still continue to cover the same geographical region because we're, we're just we're just not able to do it with the money we got. Uh, so I just want the public to know that we're, we're doing everything we can to and get every get 25 cents out of a dime, uh, but the fuel costs have accelerated exponentially in the last year, year and a half, and it's really crushing us right now over yes. transit. I was thinking this is a suggestion that maybe they could raise the bus fare to two dollars well, and cut just the buses maybe that people aren't using as often. See, see what happens with. Um, I love your suggestions, but, but but the few people that are affected, you know, everybody wants their their service. We went through this a couple times with the public hearings, and we did do a kicker on the rate last year right. when we went up. Um, we're, we're there's only two unsupported um, transits of our size in the state of Ohio that do not have a dedicated revenue source, and we're the largest one, and we don't have a dedicated revenue source to run our transit. We're already at the higher end of fees for ridership. It's, it becomes a tipping point where if you push the fees any higher, you get you actually get a decrease in ridership, so now you start bringing in less money mm -hmm. because you're not putting as many behinds in the seat. So you, 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 it becomes counterproductive. So you've got to look at where that tipping point is to whether if I raise a rate, am I going to get more revenue? I'm going to raise a rate and get less revenue. That may sound like an oxymoron, sure. but it happens. And Commissioner Kelly, you're in business. You know yep. exactly what I'm talking about there with margins. Raise your prices so high, you have less people buying from you. So uh, yeah, you know everybody. You know everybody thinks it's it's really easy, but uh, did you, you know we're, I think we're at that tipping point right now with our ridership that if we push the rates too much further, that we'll see a decrease in revenue. Plus, we have an automatic kicker that we put in. Uh, last year, and I think it goes up a few pennies or, or, a, nickel, or a dime right. or something like that this year, and I have to take a look at that towards the end of the year. Unfortunately, we go up a nickel, fuel goes up a quarter. <laughs> right. And it, not only that, is we put a, just little things that people don't think about. We put a lot of wear and tear on the, on the buses, on the tires and things like that. Well, when the fuel goes up, the cost of tires go up. And, the cost, you know, and so we're seeing all that when we don't have any revenue increasing. But everything else is increasing, and I know everybody's struggling out there. They don't. Want, I just want to say that because you know we're going into some very difficult times, and we are really, really working hard to provide a quality service. Well, I've spoke with Joe Calabrese from the Cleveland RK. They have a one percent dedicated sales tax. We're trying to get a quarter percent sales tax in Lorain County to raise seven point three, seven point four million dollars. Their quarter percent raises about thirty-five million, and they have a full one percent just for transit. About a hundred and forty million dollar budget comes from sales tax to run. So as Jim said, we're one of two who don't have a dedicated revenue for our size and it's quite depressing we see the needs out there but we also have the sheriff's department and the jails and the judges and the clerk of courts and right that all yeah. have to be funded mandated services valerie right so i see it every day the buses are full in lorraine i see that every day the I lorraine county transit buses are yeah in lorraine are full yes. every day but you it, know, it, those it are the most areas of need also right the it highest depends. section 8 housing in lorraine right. also the most uh the highest poverty rate at 27% in the city of Lorraine, so there's a larger need there. So what we're probably going to have to ask for to continue services, have the municipalities help us yes. pay for this. Yeah. We brought it up earlier in the year, but yeah, we haven't happened anything. to that? We uh, didn't uh, get any we, just, we decided to, when we went for the sales tax, we decided to wait on right. that to see what happened with the sales tax. So, uh, but if the sales tax go down, we need to revisit that issue. Um, the and Commissioner uh, Cable, you do see the buses in the city of Lorraine, and they are fuller than ever in the city of Lorraine. Some of the more rural routes, uh, you know, ridership is is moderate. In some areas, it's a little bit low. But the people that are riding it need to ride it. They don't have right. options. We don't have convenient ridership. Uh, you know, Cuyahoga gets convenient ridership. Somebody takes the the train into a terminal tower from the park and ride, and they take the bus across town, the red line, or something like that. That's convenient ridership because it's better for them not to have to park downtown. We have zero convenient ridership. We have need ridership on our buses. Uh, people don't have other options available to them when they need to travel. And that makes it a little bit more of a struggle for us because if we had some of that convenient ridership, we would generate additional revenue. 
Uh, I don't think right now, that given the, the, the hydrographical region, that we'll ever really see convenient ridership anytime soon because you have to have a significant amount of, of buses to run uh, quicker routes and go to more destinations so people ride for convenience and they're just not doing that right now. And you know, the outlook for transit is going to be very, very difficult going into the coming years, but you know, we'll do what we can. The reason for me making up the petition was many people cannot make it to the meetings for Lorraine County Transit, and for those who can't make it, I made this up, and anybody in support can sign it and send it in, and, and that's the main reason and for trying to uh, uh, get some support, you know. And, uh, many people, they don't make it to the meetings and for one reason or another, and I thought this would be a good idea. So. I think it was an excellent idea. Thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you Alan. very much. Thank you. We need to know. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, You're I all set? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ron, more comments? Yeah, we have one other dubious distinction as being number one. We are number one in the state of Ohio with the oldest fleet of transit buses. Yeah, I wasn't going to get I wasn't going to get depressed <laughs> this morning. I mean, we're, we're starting the whole things together with paper clips and rubber bands, and uh, so that's another issue there with capital replacement on some of our equipment. And we are queued for capital money from FTA, and you you and I need to get back up to FTA this fall. Uh, while we can do a lot of stuff on the phone, those personal relationships when you sit down with them uh, make a big difference in what they give you. And we just haven't been able to get up to Chicago, but sometime this fall we got to make that Chicago trip. Um, commissioners, though, the reason I came up here was to let you know that yesterday afternoon, late, um, while we were working on the, the final details for the TIF, we received notice from the airport that Snoopy 2, which I believe is a blimp, will be landing this Saturday, September 29th, at the Lorraine County Airport as a part of Family Day celebration, and this is the blimp from MetLife Insurance Company. So I know it probably will be after the, this is aired, but for any of you that can get the word out, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Any other public comment? Well, no, we, we had, had a motion. Oh, we had the motion. Yeah. Mr. Aye. Ms. Aye. Ms. Kowski. What was that for the reading? For the, yes. Okay. Oh, aye. Now we're on public comment. <laughs> All right. Public comment? Anyone leaking, looking to address the board this morning? Right. Motion to move into executive session is outlined by the county administrator and county prosecutor. Second. Mr. Cato. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. 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 Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Thursday mornings at 9.30 at the Lorain County Administration Building, 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings, and as always, you are invited to attend. Every year in Lorain County, hundreds of children are abused and neglected. Many are removed from their homes for their protection. Judges must decide their futures, but they need information to make these critical decisions. You can provide this information through Voices for Children. Volunteers are men and women from all walks of life with no special or legal background who work alongside attorneys, social workers, and other court employees. As an officer of the court, you find out as much as you can about the child. You will review records, interview parents and relatives, foster parents, talk to teachers, neighbors, and most importantly, the child. When the volunteer has a complete profile, he or she appears in court to recommend what is best for the child's future. You've heard the statistics on child abuse. Now is your chance to do something about it. You don't need any special qualifications, only the desire to protect local children who desperately need your help. To become a special advocate or for more information on our next training session, call Voices for Children today. Welcome to another broadcast of the Lorain County Commissioner's General Meeting. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Thursday mornings at 9.30 at the Lorain County Administration Building, 
226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings, and as always, you are invited to attend. Good morning. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The microphone? Got Good morning. Welcome to the September 27th, 2007 Lorain County Board of Commissioners meeting. Commissioner Kukowski has the dog today. Our quote for today. Hello, hello. You'll like this. Change is inevitable, except from a vending machine. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Oh, he's working on it, David. We have a cute one today. I don't think my microphone's working, is it? Can you hear me? We have a, actually it's a full grown, maybe a year and a half old Cocker Spaniel mix. Uh, you can come and see him at our dog kennel located on Hathaway Street. You can also check out our website online, um, Lorain County uh, Dog Kennel, and just so click on Dogs to Adopt. And we have plenty to choose from. I was just there the other day, and there's great looking dogs. So if you need a pet for your family, come on down and, and pick one out. Current boundaries of Villa, Village of Grafton, petition map and legal description were received on December 29, 2006 from Richard G. Lilly, Law Director and Gretchen Holderman, Assistant Law Director, Village of Grafton, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 503.07 to include recently annexed property and make the boundary of said township identical with the corporate limits of the municipality. Village of Grafton passed the following ordinances which accepted the various annexations of certain properties. Ordinance 06029 petition conformed and extend the current boundaries of Austinville Township to include real property annexed to the village of Grafton from Grafton Township, Ean Township, and Carlisle Township, so that the boundaries of said Rossonville Township are identical with the corporate limits of the village of Grafton. Ordinance 9167 accepted application 93.9068 acres of Ean Township, that was Shamrock Development, granted by the commissioners on April 12, 1990. Ordinance 91226 accepted the application of 43.7919 acres of Gar Carlisle Township for Shamrock Development granted by the commissioners <coughs> on February 5th, 1991. Ordinance 95023 accepted in 33.96 acres from Grafton Township. Grundy was the petitioner <coughs> granted by the commissioners on May 31st, 1995. Ordinance 00005, 31.4764 acres from Grafton Township. Commissioners appeared on October 28th, 1999. Ordinance 00012, 40.4972 acres from Ean, Town, uh, Ean Township, <coughs> which was Shamrock Development, granted by the commissioners on January 10, 2000. Well, Ordinance 02033, 1.1867 acres of, uh, from Grafton Township, that was for Brada property. Commissioners granted on August 8, 2002. And Ordinance 05032, 25.58 acres from Grafton Township, this is Carrington Estates granted by the commissioners on May 19, 2005. On January 8th, I referred all the documents to the county engineer and the auditor. January 25th, the certificate of filing was received from the auditor. On the 29th of January, auditor revealed discrepancies between the legal description ma map produced by the consultant. January 30th, engineer requested several resolutions and maps from the clerk relating to the previous documents. February 12th, the clerk sent all the documents as requested by the engineer. March 8th, the clerk forwarded to the engineer more documents from 1954 and 1955. July 12th, the engineer reviewed the documents received from the village of Grafton and the clerk. Map provided by the village had four discrepancies. August 7th, the engineer explained the discrepancies in further detail. Exhibit A and B show the, an the, the yellow shade area not annexed according to the records. Exhibit C further showed on Exhibit B, Corporation Wireless Files the Black River. Exhibit D, Correction in South Corporation Line, and Exhibit E showed 50.4 acre parcel annex by resolution in, on June 17, 1975. August 3rd, the clerk contacted the assistant law director to explain the yellow shade from the, 
from the village. August 23rd, Village of Grafton corrected the map to be used on the village's 2006 application to conform the boundaries. September 13th, the Village of Grafton amended the petition from the December 29, 2006 to include all the previous stated resolutions, um, as well as all Ward 1, 2, and 3 descriptions with the map. And then on September 29th, the engineer reviewed the amended map and petition with all the documents to conform, and the map does show the proper boundary caused by the annexation of record. Any comments, Bill, for the engineer's office? Thank you. Linda Bales is here, but I don't know if she has anything to say. Linda, any comments? No comments. No comments? Any comments from the township? That was Linda. Oh, oh it was just Linda? Okay. No attorney comments? No Jerry? Uh, none of the commissioners are required to do it if all <coughs> the legal requirements are met. Okay, wonderful. Okay. What did you say, Jerry? The, the commissioners <laughs> are required to conform the boundaries if all the legal requirements are met. And they are met? Correct. This is a have-to <coughs> commissioner. Well, I, I just wanted to hear that again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you asked me what Rossonville Township was. Yes, I did. I, I think for the benefit of anybody who might be listening, a little historical might be in order, Jerry, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, and Linda Bales, you can chime in, but I believe that Rossonville Township was formed, it's an, a paper township, and it was formed to, uh, coincide with the um, uh, limits of Grafton Village. And this uh, document then will bring all the annexations into um, the Rossonville Township, which is a non-existing paper township. Can you make a better definition of that, Jerry? No, I think that's accurate, Commissioner. Okay. <laughs> so that's what Rossonville Township is. Motion to approve. If that was, I'll second. Any further discussion? Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Ms. Aye. Uh, there is a proclamation today just to let everybody know the state wanted every county to do this. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. October 2nd will be the kickoff of the Ohio State House Atrium. And more information can be found at www.rsc.ohio.gov. Under resolutions, number one, Job and Family Services bills. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Investments. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Appropriations. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Transfers. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Advances and repayments. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kalo. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Requisitions. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Travel expenses. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Bills. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Kayla. Aye. Ms. Blair. Aye. Ms. Kowski. Aye. Under the commissioners authorize various personnel actions as indicated on the summary for employees within jurisdiction of Marine County Commissioners. Mr. Cordes. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a number of personal actions, uh, new potential new hires <coughs> at uh, Department of Job and Family Services and Golden Acres Nursing Home. Uh, plus, I wish to update you uh, on our labor negotiations uh, with the Teamsters and the United Auto Workers of America and a potential purchase of real estate that we've been discussing. I'll give you information on an update on that. Uh, and for the moment, I think that's enough, but it's going to be a bit of a session this morning because I have some significant issues in all of those that we need to discuss. So I would request an executive session to conclusion of regular board meeting, and these are all permissible topics under the Sunshine Law. Thank you. All right, community development, create an incentive district located in Lorain County, Ohio, declaring the improvement of parcels within the <coughs> district to be a public purpose and exempt from real property taxation for specific periods, designating public infrastructure improvements that will benefit or serve such parcels, requiring the owners of such parcels to make annual service payments in lieu of taxes, establish a redevelopment tax equivalent fund, approve a tax in increment financing agreement, Create a tax incentive review council incorporated by reference certain county non-discriminatory hiring policies for tax exemption re recipients and authorize related actions pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 5709.77 through 8185. And Mr. Twenty, I believe is going. To Mr. Twenty. 
Good morning, Commissioners. I thought I would give a little background. Last week, we asked you to approve the economic development plan for Amherst Township, which we identified as the first step in uh, the approval process for a TIF. We're now at step number two, um, and that is to actually ask you to consider the resolution establishing a TIF. Um, before we uh, talk at any detail about the TIF, let me just give you a little background for the audience um, here and watching this on the TV. I think it was about three years ago there was an annexation request by Mr. Parrott, Bob Parrott of R.J. Parrott Homes, wanting to annex a parcel of land into Amherst City. Um, Amherst Township was here with their attorney and protested that. and. Because Mr. Parrott was willing to, uh, to work and Amherst was willing to work and the township was willing to work, he withdrew his request for the annexation and that there was an agreement that it would remain in the township and that he would develop and get the utilities extended by the city out into the township area. Um, while doing that, he went through and, and his parcel He's proposing 41 homes, and it's about a $13,350,000 investment into Lorraine County and certainly Amherst School District. Um, the review process, because of how the sewer lines needed to be done and the manholes that were requested of Amherst, the cost of the sewer went from about 100000 to 400000 He was willing to do that, but he asked the county if we would consider extending the main downpile road at that $400,000 cost by doing a TIF. We've been in uh, considerable discussions with Mr. Parrott and everybody from the health district to the, to the city and the township concerning this project and we're now here today saying that we're at a point we have given the 14-day notice required by law to the JVS and the Amherst schools and we would like to talk a little bit about what we're asking you to, to approve in a 10-year 75 percent TIF for the uh, public improvements that will be needed in order to allow him to make this 13 million dollar uh, residential housing project materialize. Um, the sewer line extension down Pile Road will be 1,800 feet at a cost of about $400,000. By using TIF dollars, you will not be asked nor be required to assess the existing property owners on that 1,800 foot line. We've heard the, the public discussions on many uh, sewer projects, and uh, it was decided that really for the extension of that main, that that is something that a TIF could fund, and perhaps this was a better alternative, so it wasn't on the back solely of the people moving into the new development and the existing property owners. So that's the impetus for the, uh, the TIF itself. Along with that, we've also heard, you know, the state law says that if you're within 200 feet of the sewer main you have to connect to the sewer line and that has been the next point of discussion before this board um, property owners are saying the assessment my system presently works why do i have to adjust it mr cordez and i met and talked with mr parrott and um, the concept was uh, born that if the sewer project was originally going to cost Mr. Parrott 100000 or thereabout, perhaps we could have an escrow account that he would pay into so that it didn't become public funds, and then that escrow account would pay for half of the cost of the laterals or the line going from our sewer main to the house and it would include the, the tap in, the permits, it would include collapsing or slurrying the, the septic tank and making the connection to the house. Um, to be honest with you, I think Chris Conley will remember the numbers. It's been a while since I looked at the numbers, but there was a dollar amount not to exceed per house, and I think that was like $7,000 per structure. Um, or up to 50% of the cost of that construction. Typically, these connections run about 6000 So if it was a 6000 we would pay half of that or $3,000, and the other half would be paid by the property <coughs> owner. Um, we 
set this uh, escrow account up so that we could provide that assistance and it would be one less hurdle for the existing property owners. We believe there are 11 property owners. Um, two probably will be eligible for low income assistance through the CDBG. We'll go that route with them. And we're guessing there are several that are back far enough. They're not going to be required to connect, but the money is available. So we funded it so that we could help. We've asked Mr. Parrott to put $80,000 into this escrow account. As a part of that, um, the issue then come up, what do we do should the improvements and, and laterals be made if there's money left in the escrow account? We've worked it out with Mr. Parrott in the developer's agreement that unspent escrow funds will be used at the discretion of the county commissioners on future sewer projects that you deem appropriate. Um, and we have also added a sentence in there that uh, would allow if, this, if the commissioners feel it appropriate to provide assistance to the local school district. Um, that wording is in there. Just so that we have some numbers, and then I will call on Chris Conley from the attorney that helped put this up to make any legal comments that he wishes to make, but just so that we have some numbers, this $13 million investment, once we figure in a rather complicated formula with school funding, average daily student attendance, and, and things like that, the uh, Current taxes as farm property is bringing in $407 to the school district. The school formula will be adjusted if this $13 million is added to the valuation of the Amherst School District and it will reduce the amount the school district receives for reimbursement from the state of Ohio. Actually, um, by having a 75% 10-year TIF in place, instead of the full $13 million valuation hitting the formula and adjusting downward, we will only have 25% go to the school funding formula, or a little over $3 million, about $3.5 million. And so they will have less of a reduction in the payments from the school formula. But even calculating in the adjustment the best we could on the school um, with the formula adjustment and the uh, three million that will hit, the new taxes with this development once completed will be $7,659. So the, by the commissioners approving this TIF that will pay for the sewer improvement that will allow Mr. Parrott to make the investment on um, for the residential property, the county and the, the uh, township and, and school district will see $13 million of value added to their property and their tax collection at 25% will go from the current 407 to the school receiving $7,659. Um, it is our recommendation that you approve the, the TIF that this is fair and reasonable to the school district. With that, I think uh, Chris Conley is here and would like to make a few additional comments because he's worked on this for us. Morning, Chris. Morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I think uh, I, I don't have a lot to add. I think Mr. Twining did a, good, did a really good job of explaining uh, I mean, I, I could sit up here and talk about the school funding formula for hours and bore you all to death, but I, I think Mr. Twining did a really good job explaining as to how this, how this would affect the schools. And, you know, just from a stepping back a little bit and looking at the, at the forest, um, just a, as a general concept, this property undeveloped is worth, I think, about $200,000. Um, and w with the development, as Mr. Twining noted, it would be worth over $13 million. 25% of which would, would, would be taxable to the schools is still $3.4 million. So the, the, the schools will be reaping the benefits of, of, of this project, um, even, even only receiving 25% under the TIF. Um, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions, technical questions, legal questions, if you have any. Chris, uh, I see what was added. Uh, there were some concerns with the Amherst School District. But on this revised code, and I spoke to Mr. Twine this morning, 5709.82 is just for school districts. How come joint vocational school isn't included in this wording? 
because they are also a you know um, we tax entity, I guess, whatever you like to call it. Uh, yeah, subdivision. Th there is um, statutory authority for for compensating all kinds of of taxing districts, including school districts and non-school districts. As as you know. Uh, local school districts, in other words, not including joint vocational school districts, are, are protected in a lot of ways under the law with, with, with these incentives, including TIFs. Um, that language could certainly be tweaked to, to include uh, not only the Amherst schools, but if you'd like the joint vocational schools in there too, we could certainly do that. Well, my concern would be if we're going to do that area, you would have to compensate both school districts that it encompasses, would be my thing. And I don't know what the percentage is. Mm -hmm. Sure, JVS is a lot less yeah. out of the new tax.